when a force acts on an object particularly along its length it either stretches or shortens the object but can we precisely determine how much it is stretched or shortened that is exactly what we are going to explore in this video we will look at axial loads and their measurable effects learn how to calculate a deformation using simple but powerful formula and see how to handle bars with varying cross sections or materials a common situation in real world structures An axis is simply an imaginary straight line that helps us define direction along a body's geometry. For any structural member like a rod or a beam, we mainly care about three key axes. The axis that runs along the length of the member is called longitudinal axis or the axial axis. The other two axes perpendicular to the axial axis are called transverse axis. Now, when a force acts along this axial axis, we call it an axial load. This axial force can do one of two things. It can either try to push the body inward or pull it outwards. A pushing axial force compresses the body. We call this a compressive force and it results in shortening of the body's length. Conversely, a pulling axial force stretches the body. This is a tensile force and it causes the body's length to increase. Now when we actually try to figure out how much a body has stretched or shortened, we have to bring in some math, a weapon for precision. And to keep the calculations clear, we follow a sign convention. We usually take tensile forces and the elongation as positive and compressive forces and the shortening as negative. Of course, we can take tensile forces as negative and compressive forces as positive and the final physical result won't change. But it is just a convention that everyone follows and it makes easier for other person to understand when he or she looks at your calculations. But once we stick to any convention, we must keep it till end because later we will see both compressive and tensile forces acting on the same object. Keeping these signs straight will not only make our lives easier but also prevent costly mistakes. So we come back to our question. How much does an object actually stretch or shorten under these axial forces? For that, let's consider a metal rod of length L and cross-sectional area of A. A tensile force P is pulling the rod actually. As a result, the rod has stretched by some amount, say delta. Our purpose here is to know this delta. We begin with the stress generated in the body because of the applied force and which is given as the actual force over the cross-sectional area over which it is acting. This stress causes the material to deform and the amount of deformation related to its original length is called strain, which we write as this. We have discussed all these in detail in our previous video. You can check that out after this one. We also discussed there the Hooke's law that connects the stress with strain generated in the material when external load is applied to it. The Hooke's law suggests this relationship. Here E is the modulus of elasticity which is also called a Young's modulus. It is a property of the material that tells us how strongly it resists being stretched or compressed. Higher the Young's modulus, more resistant it is to deformation. Now we already have expression for sigma and epsilon. Let's substitute them into Hooke's law. Solving this, we get the value of delta. That's our formula, a clean, powerful way to calculate how much an object stretches or shortens under an axial load. Let's quickly appreciate what this formula tells us. The change in length delta is directly proportional to the applied force. More force, more stretch. 
it's also directly proportional to the original length. A longer bar will stretch more than the shorter one under the same force. But it's inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. That means a thicker bar will deform less because the force is spread over a larger area. And finally, it's inversely proportional to the E. This E represents how stiff the material is. Steel, for example, has very high modulus of elasticity. So it resists deformation. It barely stretches. Rubber, on the other hand, has very low modulus of elasticity. So it deforms easily even under small loads. We need to keep in mind that Hooke's law is only valid for certain conditions. Hence, the formula of deformation we just derived will also obey those conditions. Those conditions are assumptions that first the material must be homogeneous, meaning it has the same properties throughout. Think of a pure block of steel. It's same everywhere. We are not dealing with something that suddenly changes composition. Second, it must be isotropic. Its properties should be same in every direction. It is clear with the example of a piece of wood that it is not isotropic. Its properties are different along the grains and perpendicular to the grains. Third, the material must behave elastically and linearly. That is, stress should be directly proportional to the stream and it should return to its original shape when the load is removed. And finally, the deformation must be small. If an object stretches by a huge amount, its geometry changes significantly. And our initial assumptions like constant cross-sectional area might no longer hold true. One quick note on units. If we use SI units, newtons for force, meters for length and area, and Pascal or Newton per meter square for Young's modulus, the deformation delta will come in meters. But in the real world structures, bar and materials are rarely uniform throughout. What if the bar has different thicknesses along its length? What if it is made up of different materials welded together, each with different stiffness? For such cases, we treat the bar as a series of individual segments and apply our deformation formula to each segment separately. Each segment will have its own length, cross-sectional area and possibly material properties. For each segment, we calculate the deformation as this. And the total deformation of the entire bar is simply the sum of all segment deformations. The concepts we have explored today are very essential for understanding how materials respond to forces. We now have the tools to calculate how much a simple bar or even a stepped one will deform under an axial load. But the story of deformation doesn't end here. In our very next video, we will introduce another powerful factor, thermal expansion. I would like to thank patrons and members of my channel for supporting elementary engineering financially. If you also like the video, you can support elementary engineering on Patreon or join the channel here on YouTube to unlock members only content. There are other methods of supporting the channel too. Find the links of books and other sources I referred for the creation of this video in the description. Read actual loads and deformation at elementaryengineeringlibrary.com. Thank you.